Good evening. I call the budget work session to order. All members of the board are present. Mrs. Beeger, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? Sure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be advised that in the event of a fire emergency and an evacuation should be necessary, an alarm will sound. Please note all marked emergency exits and evacuate well away from the building. At this time, we request that everyone please turn their cell phones and other electronic devices silent. Thank you. Item 2A is our budget planning presentation. So, Superintendent Brown Hall, I turn it over to you and Mr. Matursky to review both the 2022-23 budget progress and the air conditioning project. Thank you very much, President Leatherborough. At this time, I will ask that our Chief Financial Officer, our Assistant Superintendent of Finance, uh, present the balanced $212,528,086 budget for the 22-23 school year. Mr. Matursky. Thank you, Dr. Brown Hall. So at this time, um, we'll go into the budget. Uh, this is, uh, I believe, about the fourth presentation that we've had in budget development process. And um, at this time, at this meeting, um, I would just want to start out by saying uh, the information is, um, is stable and, and has remained the same from what we've seen earlier this month. So I do want to go over um, the, the report that you're seeing on the screen. And again, this is also available on our website, so you can look at it at more detail at that point in time. Uh, just to highlight, um, this report is set up in two um, sides of the spreadsheet here. One being on the left side is the upcoming school year, the 2022-23 year. And we always want to be looking forward to the next year to understand what of these expenses may carry over. And you are seeing that all of these are our typical expenses. So there are some projections for the next year. I'm not going to be talking about them tonight. We're going to concentrate on the expenses for the 2022-23 school year. Um, the, the items here, um, I'm not going to go over the individual dollar amounts. But I just want to say that the, the number at the top is our starting number of the current year budget of $205,020,967. And then we have what we consider um, our major program um, support items, which are the, uh, the salary increases that we have, which is contractual. Um, that results in increases in our Social Security payments to the federal government, the FICA. That's about $475,000. Again, health insurance is going up um, as we've received information from our carrier and our consultants. Um, we also have retirement system increases, which are required to be paid um, to New York State for our certified as well as our um, support staff. Uh, we have our BOCES increase, and BOCES, for those of you who may not be familiar, is Board of Occupational um, Education Services, and that supports our students, it supports our administration. It's many different items in that budget, and there's increases there, as well as pupil, <coughs> pupil transportation, our fuel costs and contractor increases, and then we have some instructional support items at the very bottom of about 338,000. So what does that total? Um, $7,602,119. And that provided a working expense budget of just over $212.6 million. So that was at 3.71%. As we went forward in this budget development process, um, we have the need for two additional assistant principals at the middle school level, one being at transit middle, one being at mill middle. And I think we all know those student populations have increased in those schools. So we're going from one assistant to two and that's an increase of $160,000. Uh, we also have at this point in time retirements. We also consider retirements as a budget reduction and that uh, provides that reduction amount of $255,000. And so as we look at the totals here, um, all of those numbers result in a budget increase of $7,507,119 and a working budget of $212,528,086. That's a 3.66% increase. 
Going at the revenue side, again, for those of you looking at this on screen, um, it's probably very small, uh, but you can again go to our website, but this is the detailed revenue budget. I just wanna highlight a couple major items here. First of all, state aid. The net change is 1.9 million plus 1.9 million. That's a good number, but actually there's a bigger story here. If you looked at this current budget year, you see we have almost $3 million in federal aid that was put in there. That aid is no longer in next year's budget. And so as a result, really our state aid has increased $5 million. That is a very, very good thing for the district, not just for next year's budget, but for the future, because there no longer is a cliff that we would see when that federal aid goes away, which will go away in the following school year. Additionally, um, we have um, increases that we're seeing in our payment of lieu of taxes. That's essentially information that the school district doesn't truly control. It's from the um, IDA or industrial development agencies, whether it be Erie County or Amherst. Uh, so those provide us the changes in those, and we have an increase occurring in those agreements over the next year. Um, and we also have, of course, I think we all know this, we've seen it in the counties, um, uh, sales tax <coughs> receipts, $1.6 million increase. All of those things result in, um, in, a, in a very good revenue situation for us, a balanced revenue budget to what I presented on the expense side. We have um, a tax levy increase that is under the tax cap, which is um, essentially at $3,410,000. So again, tax levy increase here is going to be at 2.55%. The budget increase is at 3.66%, and you see that the um, the budget is balanced at $212,528,086. And again, I uh, can't emphasize enough, there is not going to be any reliance on federal aid in next year's budget um, or the future budgets at this point in time. When we look at um, what this means to our tax bills, uh, looking at a house assessed at $250,000, there's three scenarios here based upon really where you are in your um, uh, in the purchase of your home. If you recently purchased it, you're not going to get a star credit anymore. You're going to be able to take a credit on your tax income tax bill, New York State income tax. And that results in about a $77 increase. If you have basic star, it's $68.35. And enhanced star is $57.61. The rate is estimated at $18.14, 31 cent increase, 1.73. But the important thing I need to share is that the information is based upon 2021 um, assessed values as well as equalization rates. We don't receive this information um, until it's normally July. And so that's why these rates will no more normally go down uh, rather than go up. So I wanted to share that uh, right now with everyone. So just a summary on where we are. There's a lot of positives with this budget. Um, no program cuts is number one. Um, no future budget shortfalls, as I mentioned, due to the reduction of federal revenue. Uh, we've got some very, very good growth in our payment of lieu of taxes and sales tax. Those are some of our major other revenue categories. And again, some additional support positions um, and definitely we're under the tax cap, so it's just a simple majority vote. On the negative side, um, not a lot, but I always want to make everyone aware of the future. And the future here is, will New York State be able to sustain the state aid increases a couple years down the road? Not next year, but a couple years down the road when their federal revenue starts to be reduced. So again, this is just a summary of where we've uh, done, uh, where we are on our, our budget uh, timeline and so forth. And what we're, uh, we have a budget feedback uh, for, um, item on our website. You can see it here. You can send any questions in um, and we will uh, certainly get back to anyone who has questions on that. So with that, uh, this short presentation is complete. Thank you very much, Mr. Matursky, for all your hard work on this and for your updates every month along the way. Um, I will start on my left and continue on the table to see if there's any questions. I will just add for our audience, we as a board have been asking questions each month throughout this process. So I don't know if there's any questions left, but I will open the floor if there are any. Oh, I, I think I invented questions. But, uh... <laughs>
Um, first of all, I wanted to uh, take away a thunder for a moment, but I'll thank Mr. Matursky and his team for presenting and all this information. Uh, first, I want to thank you. I had asked last time about uh, we've always for years used uh, a tax rate or the tax is 150000 uh, is the property value. But as we all know, there's not much you can buy uh, in this Williamsville for that amount. So it was nice to see you raise it to two fifty. dollars mm -hmm. um, You know, as I always ask, we always try to balance uh, the needs of our students with uh, the taxpayers uh, and, and their expenses. Uh, you've allocated or shown very well the increases in the budget. Uh, you've only really mentioned one reduction in expenses, which was a teacher retirement. Uh, I know there have been others, and I don't know if now's a good time to just say maybe you could comment a bit on some other expenses we've reduced uh, in this budget so that, uh, you know, we have clarity on that. Uh, very good question, Dr. Lippman. And what we do uh, as we really initiate the budget development process is uh, there's a review of every single budget code. And every budget code is looked at from a couple different perspectives. It's looked at historically, especially pre-COVID, because COVID has had some ramifications on how the dollars have been um, expended and how the budget has performed. So we look at pre-COVID, we look at it, what happened in the last year, we look at what's going trending in the current year, and then we, we kind of forecast for the future. So what that has really transitioned in is, uh, what we what we call reallocating budget dollars. So in some ways, that's a savings. And I'll give you some really prime examples that in this current budget, there is probably about a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar increase within the changing the budget codes within the special education department. It doesn't mean that their budget has um, changed substantially. It's just that we know that we had some dollars and some codes that we needed to reallocate to other codes, especially in private agency placements and in some of the contractual areas. So that has taken place in this budget. Additionally, if you look at some of the, uh, there is a $338,000 increase in the supplies, but there are some other adjustments that were made as we went through the budget to, um, to make uh, the budget balance better. And what I'll sh share is another example is we've been uh, required to pay BOCES approximately a million dollars each year uh, for um, their, our, our share of their capital project building. So that is now no longer necessary. So those dollars, which were in our debt service, uh, were up in a different code. They are now back in our debt service. So those are the items, and that's going to be kind of uh, integrated into the next uh, presentation when you talk when I talk about debt service in the next capital project. That's how we're, we're making sure things work through in that manner. As far as efficiencies, um, we're always looking for efficiencies. We're always looking for, you know, doing more with the money we have. Um, you all see the purchasing that we do and the bids that we do constantly. We're always looking to try and take advantage of that, whether it be through a bid process or whether it be through items such as um, uh, going through a co-op pricing. Um, the last example I'll give you, I think that's um, really relevant here is um, the New York Power Authority project that we are just at the end of completing here, which is replacing all of our district lighting with LED. Um, that is reducing our usage substantially. And, and again, um, that is kind of integrated into what might be a higher usage in the future um, with the uh, potential air conditioning project coming on. So again, it's balancing off our expenses in a manner where we don't have to increase the budget. Thank you, thank you. Any other questions from the board? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Maturski. Just a question, um, just to go over. I know you said that we are looking at a budget that's maintaining what we currently have and then the addition of two assistant principals at the middle school. So with that, are you including um, maintaining the positions that we did receive some of that American Rescue Funding, CARES Act, whatever it was, but for our social emotional learning, the learning labs, the specialists and teachers that we hired, are they looking at continuation as well? Those, uh, the way those dollars are um, accounted for at this point in time um, is that they are still in those grants. Those, those two, um, there are ARP, American Recovery Plan, which is now also termed ESSER 3, 
we have ESSER two and GEAR two. Those are the two, those are really the three grants that are accounting for those dollars. They continue into the next fiscal year and actually the a portion of the year after. So those are not in this budget. Um, there, that will be something that will need to be reviewed as we go forward um, into the next budget cycle to determine what we can do on reallocations. So I, I do think though, knowing what those dollar amounts are in those budgets, they're not what I would call excessive for those programs. So I do believe there will be ability to do a review of what our current budget is and how it's performing, do some reallocations and, and absorb them into that next year's budget development process without any reduction in those programs. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. Any other final questions on the budget? Okay, I think we are ready to move to the capital project. Okay, grab this. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you again. Uh, so this is a presentation on what would be a, a, a new capital project. Uh, it's the elementary school air conditioning capital project. Again, um, we've had some discussions on this over the last several months, uh, and we have made a decision to phase this project and with the elementary schools being the very first uh, phase of it. So again, some of the background here uh, there's a lot of positive factors, of course, to be doing this project, and there's a lot of reasons why this makes a lot of sense, especially at this point in time. I'm not going to go over all the details here. Um, in addition to this presentation, there also is a detailed executive summary that is on our website that is available for everyone to review. But I just want to indicate that I think we all have experienced the higher uh, temperatures in the fall, um, in the spring, and as well in the summer. And uh, a few years ago, again, prior to COVID, we actually had um, some very high temperatures um, in our buildings in September. And at that point in time, um, we, we actually had um, some very concerns about whether we should be holding school on those days. This is a report that was done um, and reviewing the temperatures from uh, NOAA RISA team from 1951 to 2012. It was the latest report uh, available at the time. Again, you look at 10 years from 2012 and we've seen even more increases, but this just showed the actual documentation of the review that just said our temperatures are rising. Uh, when we look at the heat days and, and what the impact was, uh, again, we had temperatures in September that were 90 plus back in September, 2018. Uh, at the same time, there were the uh, New York State United Teachers had contacted legislation in New York State and wanted to ask them to approve something called extreme heat days. And, and this would impact our calendar. Certainly, we plan for snow days, but this would uh, possibly uh, have an impact on the 180-day schedule. And it might be uh, a problematic for us because in addition to the fact that you would be off on a day, um, our buildings are our masonry construction, and they just do not cool down. If you've got heat in them, they do retain that heat. And that was one of the things we actually learned in 2018. So this is more than just looking at air conditioning. Uh, when we looked at this, especially coming off COVID, we wanted to make sure we were going to improve the air filtration systems in our building. And we were going to go with a minimum of MERV 13. There's going to be a lot of new duct work which these buildings are more, no, more, more, most of the elementaries were built in, the, in basically the 60s. So we're looking at 70 year old buildings here and we're gonna be able to do a lot to improve the mechanical systems, the delivery of, the, of air filtration in the buildings, as well as do some other items that are kind of tangent to this, such as some cabinetry adjustments and improvements in the classrooms. So it's, it's a lot more than just doing the air conditioning, although that's the focus. There's some other tangible items that this will be improving in the pond. The one uh, area that's not uh, elementary school um, associated but must be done is the electrical service for East High School. 
as part of this program, we had to look at what the capacities were for each of these schools as we were looking at it district-wide initially and determine if that had to be adjusted. And when we did that, we found that the, uh, the original 70 uh, so uh, electrical service at East High School was um, at the extended period of its life and that we really needed to make sure we adjusted that. So that's about a $1.4 million number in this project and it does need to be done so that we can maintain a constant electrical service in that school. So again, looking at what we're looking for as far as this project, there are some factors here that impact how we came up with our cost estimates. And what I wanna emphasize is when you're doing an estimated cost, you do not want to have a, a project budget that can't provide for the building of the project. That's the most important thing. So we did a thorough analysis. We had our professionals on board to do this. We had district um, integration in that process from day one. Um, we have reviewed the plans, gone back and forth, probably over 50 to 100 times. And as a result, we've come up with um, a, a list of items which we wanted to make sure were integrated. Again, I'm not going to go over all these items, but you can know that we did a thorough analysis to make sure that this budget, which you're seeing here, is going to support the program. Uh, so as you can see, um, the budget is essentially $62.7 million dollars for the elementary piece alone, adding that 1.4 million for the East High School Electrical Service creates a proposition budget of $64,119,318. So one of the most important factors then is, how are we gonna pay for this? And, and, and this is, I think, the piece where we did a lot of, of, of review of our finances, and we did a lot of um, analysis of how we could make that budget work and making sure, again, that we could support the construction. So the very top item is $37,301,159 of debt service bond funding. Those are the dollars that we have to borrow to support this project. And, uh, and I'm going to go over that in, in a lot more detail on a future slide here. But what I can say is that um, we're able to use about $24 million in those next three capital reserves, that's essentially our savings account, um, to lower that, um, that amount that we would have to borrow to the $37.3 million. And then we are able to add about $3 million in budgetary appropriations in those two out years, which creates a balanced budget, the $64,119,318. So the key here is that we looked at our, our general fund budget, and we looked at how much is in it, and it's similar to a household budget. If you have a car payment and you get to the end of the payment, now you have whatever that payment amount was available. That's essentially what we've done here. Um, but there's one other very important item that is not like your car payment, and that is when your debt is, is paid mm -hmm. off with the school district, you also are not receiving the state aid for that debt. And when that happens, your general fund revenue will go down. So when a school district such as us has that happen, really the key item is you want to make sure that you can sustain that because since it's already in our budget, we would actually have a budget cut in a future because if our state aid goes down and we don't have dollars to replace it, you've got to go back and cut the, the expense budget. That's why this project also is very important because it, it keeps that instructional cut or wherever general fund cut from happening. So again, uh, this talks about uh, the fact that there's zero impact on the tax levy and the tax rate. Um, I, I've already kind of go, gone over the fact that debt service is budgeted annually. Old debt is paid off. Um, and so that, that allows us to take on this new debt. Um, there's no additional debt budget needed in the general fund. And so that means no, no, no budget increase in the general fund in the future, no budget increase for the tax levy because, again, nothing's impacted here, and there's no tax rate impact either. So this is what I want to just be transparent with everybody to see what I'm talking about when, when, I, when we're talking here about our debt service. What does it really amount to? So this is showing you that we have a level debt service of about $4.8 million dollars. This is a uh, second column is really showing you the uh, the amount of our debt and how it's paid off. 
And then you're seeing what we need as far as what's available. And then lastly, uh, in that fourth column, you're seeing for $37,301,159, um, what's the amount that we would have to pay annually. And the most important thing is in that last column where you're seeing there actually is still a little surplus. That surplus is important because this is at a 4% interest rate borrowing. We have a um, AAA2 rating, which is one of the best in probably is best in this area, number one, mm. but is one of the best in the state. And that allows us to get lower interest rates. Um, we also are selling our, our thing on the open market and it's a tax exempt, which is very attractive to um, to the community. And, and you know we get a lot of major banks and, and other type investment bank uh, that bid on our product. And so as a result, um, this, is, this is really a conservative number, but if it were to go up, the point I wanna show is there actually is still some, some ability there to fund an increase if it had to go up, and that was done on purpose. Uh, lastly, I talked a lot about state aid at the very beginning. I wanna share that this is what the state aid would look like. So again, uh, this is getting into some of the specifics, and this is really based upon New York State Education Department and how they tell us they're going, they want us to report the information. So there's a construction budget and there's an incidental budget. Um, incidental budgets typically are your, um, your architect, your construction manager, and believe it or not, any site work goes into that category. Um, so as a result of that, you come up with your, your total budget, and then you see how I've uh, put it down below and broken those out, and there's a part that's not going to be aidable. So is that because we've done something wrong? No, it's because the New York State Education Department reviews your items, and sometimes they'll say, this is something that we're not going to aid, and there's different reasons for that. And so as a result, there's a deduction here made in that category. In the very bottom, you'll see that of that 64 million, it's approximately $60.9 million will be um, uh, available for aid. Our aid percentage is 62.7% for construction projects, which is much higher than what it is in our general fund, by the way. Um, and that results in $38,192,672 as an estimated state aid amount for the entire project. Now the state pays this over 15 years, so that will result in an increase, in an annual increase of $2,546,178. And that's the piece that will actually come back and help us in those future budgets. So again, just kind of reviewing, um, you know, what this is about, um, you know, the aid will go on for 15 years. There's no general fund debt increase as a result of this. Um, and so as a result, you're in not increasing the debt budget is what I'm talking about there. This means that the revenue side supports programs and you're not losing anything. And, uh, and again, this is what will keep the, the general fund budget stable in the future. So with that, you know, the next question might be, okay, if this is approved, when, when will this all happen? And, uh, and this is the timeline. So uh, this is all really um, structured by New York state because we will then start the actual construction document design in June, this June. It will likely go right through the end of the year with plans being submitted to the New York State Education Department in January 2023. Um, and then the State Education Department, uh, they take several months to do a review. And so we're expecting um, approval to come in sometime around September 2023. And then uh, the bid process occurs. These are publicly bid projects. That would be October, November, and you would start construction likely in April 2024, and it would go on for two years, uh, be completed thereabouts in August 2026, and uh, with a final project completion likely to be December 2026. One other item I want to note here is this is going to be the first time that a project will be having construction going on during the school year. That's, that's an important thing because we've never really done that um, in past projects. It's always been summer construction, but the way this project is required to be done, there's no other way that we could do it but to do it during the school year. Mm -hmm. So this is just our project timeline and we're here in March. Uh, for again, another uh, presentation and review and discussion with the vote
being in uh, May 17th, 2022. Thank you very much, Mr. Majerski. And back to the board for any questions on the AC project. Vice President Van Seis. So there's already been some discussion um, happening in the community regarding why elementary schools. So just two questions that maybe you can you know, share was first the rationale for choosing to do the elementary schools first. Mm -hmm. And is there going to be a phase two and a phase three or other phases that will include middle school and high school? Uh, excellent questions, of course. And the answer is that as we went through this and we know how um, the younger students are impacted more severely by the heat. And, and especially we've seen it during the school year, you know, we've seen it in summer school, especially. Um, and, and, and in fact, um, as you may know, our summer schools now over the last few years, we have moved them from elementaries because they're too hot in the summer and we've moved them to a middle school. And that's not necessarily the right location for those programs. Um, it, 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 there's a lot, we, we do the best we can. We do a lot of moving of furniture and everything to make it work. And we would continue to do that, but it's not the best. So going back to this project, it made the most sense to start there and make sure that we get those buildings um, uh, rectified and air conditioned. As far as the next phase, um, I, I really think the next phase is one more phase. I don't think it's two. Um, if you think about what the total cost will be, it'll probably be similar to this for the next two middle and high together. So my, my assumption would be when you're into about 2025 in this construction timeline, that's when we're going to start to think about, OK, how did it go? Where are we in construction? And start to think about a new proposition for the balance of the school district. And remember, uh, we do have East High School completely air conditioned transit middle completely air conditioned and the KC addition completely air conditioned. So it's not really those other buildings, it's a smaller scope. And, and that's why I think you're gonna see one more proposition happening in 2025. Thank you so much. Thank you for that, Mr. Biscalia. Um, after hearing that it will be construction during the school year, have we thought or developed any plans moving forward so that stuff disrupt, disrupt uh, student learning, especially at the elementary level, um, including any constructual issues that may occur that, you know, might not be safe for students when they're in the school. Definitely. Um, the, the current budget actually includes the usage of portable classrooms. So uh, we definitely want to keep students safe. We, we know that um, the way it's, it's somewhat planned at this point is you would probably be taking a few classrooms um, out of service at a time. Um, construction would be happening. It, you might close down a wing, but it, it will definitely be something that will um, consider the safety of students and staff as the utmost concern over anything. And yet the portable classroom model actually is being used in North Tonawanda right now. So there's actually school districts in, that are using it now. Um, and so we've actually looked at that and we know that that would work here. Uh, we know it's a proven method for safety as well as, as learning. And these classrooms are not like what you would have seen in the, you know, um, what if anyone's familiar with what was at High Middle, for example. That was a little tin building that was there that was, these are no longer like that. These are really almost like customized buildings. So that's one way. We're also talking about ways that we could possibly maybe not even need portable classrooms by um, changing the way we're going to do the work on second shift and allowing the work to still happen, clean everything up, and, and the teachers would not even realize, um, you know, to a great extent that the construction has been occurring at night in their in their area. So that's portable classrooms is in the budget, in this budget, and that's how we proceed right now. But we are, we're not going to just stop there. We're, we're going to be asking other questions if this is approved on what the best way is for instruction as well as construction. Thank you. Final thoughts or questions? Mrs. Baker? Yeah, uh, I appreciate what you shared about um, the ability to fund an increase if the prices are to go up. One of my initial concerns was, you know, we've seen 
over the last couple of years, some prices skyrocket and different things and, and who knows what's to come in the future. So I really appreciate that that is built in there to give us a little bit of wiggle room. Um, I'm just wondering if you can share, you went through um, at length and it's much appreciated how we plan to fund this. For people uh, who are here at our community forum tonight or watching, um, can you just clarify for them again, when they go to the polls, if they see this as a capital project, um, if they vote to approve this, will there be any increase in their tax bill as a result of this project? Or does this have no um, increase, um, any effect or impact on their tax bill? Yes, uh, there will be no impact on their tax bill, not just in this year, but throughout the entire project. And, and again, um, it's all based upon, you know, the financial model and the strategic planning that we've done over the years here. And, and one of the other items that allows us to do that just so that, um, you know, we know is that we're able to sometimes pay down debt also. And those debt pay downs has allowed this model that you saw on the debt service to work the way it does. But yes, um, there's not going to be an increase in, in the budget for this. And if there's no budget increase, it doesn't impact the levy, which is their tax bills in the end. Excellent. Thank you for all your work so that um, that's a possibility for us in our community. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mrs. Speaker. Anyone else from the board wish to speak before we open it up to our community? All right. We're so happy to see so many people here tonight. At this time, the Board of Education welcomes anyone in attendance who wishes to speak about the budget to the podium at this time. So this is the piece just related to the budget, and then we'll be moving into our community forum in just a few minutes. Anyone here tonight want to come to the podium and ask a question or raise a concern, give, give a comment about the budget process or the air conditioning project? You can come right up. Podium. Yep, come right up, please. That way everyone at home can hear you too, because we're live streaming. Hello. Hi. 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 Um, my name is Angela Mecker. I'm a parent of a daughter at Heim. And the question I have is in regards to doing construction in homes that are built prior to 1978 and the um, concern that they may contain lead paint, um, especially if construction is happening actually during you know active school hours. Uh, how are we going to make sure that that's not something that's exposed because once it is... Um, you know, if there's drilling and ductwork being put in, how is that going to be um, done in a way that is safe for our children? Um, are, are we also, and also, are we are we testing the homes for the the I'm, not the homes, but the uh, the properties for lead? Uh, absolutely. So, as uh, Mr. Matursky stated, that's our ultimate concern, right? Making sure it's safe for not only our students, but our faculty and staff. Mm -hmm. So a great deal of testing takes place, air quality testing, samples testing, okay. to make sure that whatever we do is safe for our students while the construction is going on before and after. Okay. Absolutely. And I know um, environmentalists can be really pricey. So is this already in the budget for the testing? Mm -hmm. Is this already estimated? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Great. Yeah, and it can be pricey, but, you know, for the safety of our students, it's, you know, okay. no cost too much. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. Anyone else? Okay. So at this time, may I please have a motion to adjourn the budget work session? We will take a five-minute recess and then begin our community forum. <coughs> Dr. McCleary, thank you. And Dr. Lippman, second. All in favor? Opposed or abstention? Seeing none. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. We're just going to take a five minute break and then we'll be right back. All right. Welcome to those joining us in person and through the universe on Zoom tonight. My board mates and I are here in the capacity of public servants and elected officials at the local level to listen to your ideas for the continuous improvement of our school district that's in line with the mission and vision of our district. As board members, we have no individual authority. The state grants us legal authority over the school district only when we act together as a governing body in compliance with state education laws and laws pertaining to open government. As such, 
such, we ask that you direct your comments to the entire board and refrain from addressing individual board members. Due to privacy laws and labor relations rules, we also ask that you do not speak about specific students or staff by name. Instead, we invite you to schedule a meeting with the appropriate administrator if you have a specific concern related to a specific student or staff member. Board members Biscalia and Dr. McClary have agreed to facilit facilitate tonight's community forum. Mr. Biscalia and Dr. McClary will alternate between questions from the audience, pre-submitted questions, and questions from those participating tonight on Zoom. We will do our best to listen and respond to as many people as possible and plan to conclude around 9 p.m. We do ask for your patience. This is the first time we're running a forum where we are um, addressing people in person and on Zoom and entertaining pre-submitted questions at the same time. We tried to be as accessible and accommodating as possible. So thank you for your patience as we do our best to get through this. Please be considerate of your neighbors who may be waiting to speak and limit your comments to three minutes. And as always, we are a community rooted in love, kindness, and respect. We teach these behaviors to our children and we lead with example. We will show this to you and we ask that you do the same. So Dr. McClary and Mr. Biscalia, I turn it over to you to facilitate tonight's community forum. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Leatherbarrow. Um, let's begin this evening with Jenna Block and Lena Galante, who are um, students of South. Hi, my name is Jenna Block. And I'm Lena Galante. And we are the co-presidents of the DECA chapter at Williamsville South. DECA stands for Distributive Education Clubs of America, and it's a business club that is offered all over the nation for high school students and even into the collegiate levels. We are here on behalf of Williamsville South and North DECA national participants, and we are asking for the removal of the parent chaperone component of the internal procedure for the national competitions in our district. If this cannot be removed, we are proposing for the option for a parent to sign a waiver. As DECA presidents, we are eager to embark on this important and potentially life-changing opportunity. As upstanding senior students in the community, we can showcase our responsibility and maturity during our trip to Atlanta, Georgia in late April. We are not only a part of DECA, but also members of the Student Congress, Students Against Destructive Decisions, National Honor Society, Link Crew, the NABA campaign, and amongst many other groups. Our involvement in our community is our utmost priority and we have stellar academic and behavioral records. With that being said, we are the only district in the state that has this parent chaperone rule in place. This is not a DECA rule or a DECA state rule. All other chapters throughout the nation are able to travel to the convention with just their school advisor. All current students from Williamsville yearning to attend this national convention this year have agreed to sign a waiver protecting the district. The waiver would state that the Williamsville Central School District is not liable for anything that occurs on the trip and anything else that you deem appropriate that you would want on the waiver. Due to the fact that many other traveling groups, including clubs, sports, and music groups, do not have this restriction, we urge you to look into this matter. After immense research, we have found that this procedure is only internally written and is not a formal board policy. All rules that must be followed at the state level competition of DECA without a parent chaperone will be followed at the national level. Curfew as well as attendance at events will be mandatory and all DECA etiquette will be brought with us to the competition. There are high standards that DECA students live up to, especially those that make it to the national level. And we value competence, innovation, integrity, and teamwork. We have won the state level competition for a reason and we want a chance to prove ourselves at the national level. We want to represent Williamsville Central School District and shine as top competitors and young leaders of America. The presence of a parent chaperone does not change our behavior or guarantee our safety. Instead, it puts an undue burden on a family member to cover another large conference and hotel stay fee, an additional airfare, meals, and any incidental expenses that happen while on the trip and take multiple days off from their jobs and leave their families for five days. We are the only school district within the state of New York that requires a parent chaperone for this event. 
The New York State DECA attendance criteria states that there must be a minimum of one adult advisor for every eight high school division student delegates. With that being said, the North and stu South students that qualified for nationals are a small group. Just our two DECA advisors are more than enough for the seven students between the North and South high schools. If we are able to attend the competition, seven young, motivated, and academically capable students will have a fighting chance at being a national DECA champion represent, representing the Williamsville School District. With your help, we will have an opportunity that we have been looking forward to for many years. The Williamsville Central School District should be supporting and not holding back our excellent students due to an an internal policy affecting a few. As a district, we should pride ourselves and encourage our students to expand their education in any way possible. We should not be hindered by a procedure that isn't even considered a district policy because of a previous incident. We want to pave the way for future DECA members who are also given this outstanding opportunity. As seniors, we have endured countless disappointments and cancellations related to COVID-19. We have also experienced the tragic loss of our of two classmates. The past few years have not only been filled with stress and uncertainty, but have also been emotionally challenging. After finally earning the opportunity, we feel that we deserve a chance to experience this once in a lifetime event. We urge you to please consider altering this policy. Thank you for your time and consideration. And we are looking out for ourselves and the future of DACA and anything will help. And we understand that if this policy can't be put in place this year, that it be changed for the years to come for DACA students following us. Thank you, ladies. Okay. Uh, before, before you leave the podium, any member of the board want to make a comment or ask a question? Well, you know what? We'll, do our procedure that we do. We'll start here, move down, and then the next question will go this way. Can I change my seat, please? So I, uh, <laughs> um, I just want to comment because, again, I have experience. I was uh, a DECA advisor when I was a high school teacher four of the six years where um, I ran a, a DECA chapter. I had students who attended the national conference. Uh, the last national conference I went to was in uh, 1984 in New Orleans with students. So that's a very long time ago. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you one thing from my experience, uh, you know, going um, students uh, are well supervised. Um, you know, students who attend these conferences uh, are among the best and the brightest business and marketing students in the country. It's a great opportunity. Uh, we're talking about I worked in the state of Georgia at that time. And I'm thinking in the 1980s in Georgia, we did not have parent chaperones. This is the year 2022 in Williamsville. Uh, I don't um, believe that uh, that policy or, you know, that idea uh, is a 2022 issue. So again, I'm supportive of your success and I would believe going with your DECA advisor under their supervision and the supervision of all these uh, DECA uh, leadership that you will be successful and you will be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I saw Mrs. Leatherbarrow. Is there anyone else before Mrs. Leatherbarrow? First of all, I just want to say congratulations. That's a huge accomplishment, and everyone here clapped for you. We, we share in that. Congratulations. We're very proud of you for that. Are you the same girls that wrote us? Because we did receive yes. a letter about us. Okay. So when we received your letter, we did immediately reach out to Superintendent Brown Hall, which is the protocol when a board receives a concern or complaint. We always go through our superintendent. Um, so, Dr. Ronald, if it's okay for me to speak about sure, email exchange, um, one of the questions that I had, and we spoke on the phone about this as well, is, you know, how does this differ from an athletic event or a school club? I've had three children go through the schools. They've traveled for athletics. They've traveled for clubs. You know, why would this be different? And how does the liability for our district change? And so that was something that we were asking our superintendent to look into with our attorney. Mm -hmm. Are you prepared to speak on that at all yet? Or do you want to wait? Or Right. Well, the, the attorneys are still looking into it. But you, 
I, can I just talk about the one point you yeah. brought up about the liability and sign, signing of waivers? And, and that becomes tricky, right? Because when you sign waivers, they sometimes mean something, they sometimes don't. Because if there's a nexus between you attending the event and you being the representative of the district, that supersedes it, right? You, you are a representative of the district. So ma no matter what you sign, we're still responsible for you, right? And we, we will be responsible for you when you go. You know, and so that's why we met with the attorneys today even further so we can get a position on that, because my understanding, this internal memo in the rules governing it is from 2017 when legal advice was sought about another um, event, another national event. And that's where these rules came up and the attorneys helped craft these. So we're taking a fresh look at it five years later to see if that really needs to remain in place. But I believe in the internal rules also, there was a bullet in there that said if parents have another parent um, act as a liaison, as a supervising parent, that is allowed. And I believe that is ultimately what occurred in your situation, which will be allowing you all to go, correct? Yes. And that was what was communicated to us, just so that you're aware. We were told that in this situation, because when we got your email, it's my understanding you needed to know by like the next morning. It was yeah. very time constrictive. So you know, we asked Superintendent Brown Hall, can you please see what can be done? He informed the board that Dr. Balin and himself had worked many hours on this to yeah. really try and make it happen. Because whenever possible, we want to. We want things to be a yes for our students. We don't want there to be barriers. Um, so going forward for the future, when we talk about inclusion, include that word inclusion involves breaking down barriers, right? And so that is the piece that we still don't have an answer for yet because we have to consider the advice from our attorneys. We do have to consider liability and safety. Um, not all seniors are 18. You know, so we have to take that into consideration as well. Um, but we will look into the claim. I, you mentioned that Williamsville's the only district with this rule. Can you let me know where you got that information from? So we travel to the state level competition and all other chapters is what they're called. Basically just yeah. school like DECA chapters are able to go with just advisors and a lot more than two or seven students usually make to nationals because when you go to like Long Island and places like that, the schools are much bigger. So they go with like five or six DECA advisors and no parental chaperone whatsoever. All right. And that makes sense to me, right? Because we see that happen with our student athletes all the time. Right. In fact, the same day that you sent your email, I was watching a video about the North track team where they had two students go to nationals in one place, like fourth in an event. And so we can't expect the parents to be able to, you know, bear the cost of it as you right. shared and take the time off from work. So if it's possible, we're going to work for it to become a yes. Um, I want to thank you for coming to advocate for that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. And I also want to thank uh, the administrators at North and South who worked with us yes. to make sure that this was able to happen. So thank you, ladies, very much for that email also. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Anyone else on the board want to comment? Mr. Biscalia? I, I was at DECA South. <laughs> um, no, that's okay. It takes a lot of courage what you guys did today um, or tonight. But I, I was a, in DECA. It was an awesome experience. It helped me when I went into college. Um, and I, I do agree with Dr. Lippman, and it, I'm, I'm glad we're looking into this because, you know, first and foremost, we need to be looking out for you guys, mm -hmm. the students. And um, going to nationals is something wonderful to put on your college applications or, or whatever it may be that you're doing after school. And I think it's um, it's nice that you said even if it doesn't change today, what caught me is even if it doesn't change today, we want to help our future students. And that's something that true leaders yeah. that I know DECA teaches you. Um, it was excellent. It was, it was music to my ears to hear you guys say that, because I think even if it's not changing for these uh, two wonderful ladies that we really need to look at it for the future, Definitely. we can't forget and just say, Hey, sports, 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 mm -hmm. and forget about our, our wonderful clubs. So good job, bro. Thank you. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you, ladies. We appreciate you coming and certainly good luck next month yes thank you yes. Yeah, i just want to make one again besides wishing <laughs> again. you all the greatest of success there but um you know one of the things that we say is there there are um activities that are co-curricular that tie and align to the curricula mm -hmm. curriculum like 
DECA, those types of uh, clubs. And then we have the extracurricular, you know, the athletics and those types of things. And, um, and again, if we don't need chaperones at extracurricular activities like athletes, uh, it would seem logical in a co-curricular activity that you would extend that. So we'll wait for the answer. Parental chaperones, you mean. Chaperones are necessary. But you're speaking of specifically parental chaperones. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. I'll send them off on their own. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Not till, not till they're 18 and they graduate. Then they're on their own. Thank you, Dr. Um, I think now. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. President Mother Brown. Um, as we continue with our in-person part of the forum, let me ask if there are any other students who are here that had planned on speaking tonight. Students. Nope. All right. Um, we're going to transition for a moment into Mr. Biscalia, who's going to do some um, pre-submitted questions. Yeah, uh, I'd like to go through the pre-submitted questions first, um, and we'll go back and forth between people who came and pre-submitted questions, and then once the questions are done, I'll move on to the Zoom, uh, people that are at Zoom. Um, some people, I just want to let you know, uh, submitted you know multiple questions, but I'm going to read one from each person who submitted it because we'll be able to email answers back to the other questions, and I think it's fair for the people that came out tonight to get their questions answered. I know everyone's busy, and, and you took the time to come out tonight. So we'll start with the first question. Who uh, This person wanted to remain anonymous, anonymous sorry. Um, is the district, would, would they be willing to modify their stance to service English language learners based on their educational needs rather than only providing the bare minimum requirements? Would you like me to re repeat that, board? Yeah. It, would the district be willing to modify their stance to service English language learners based on their educational needs rather than providing the bare minimum requirements. So this person is saying that, that we're only requiring the minimal things that are needed for English language learners. Um, we need to take, you know, what we take into multiple services to help them in the future. And I'll start down here with Dr. Lemon. You know, uh, as I said, I should change my seat, but, uh, <laughs> You know, if you think about it, our responsibility as a board and as a community is to meet the needs of students where they are and then move them to where they need to go. Uh, I don't know the specifics uh, of that whole area, uh, although, you know, I've worked in school districts where we've had uh, large numbers of English language learners, but I don't uh, know specifically uh, on this one. Yeah, I would just say, you know, I also don't know the full scope of what we do or offer for our English language learners. Um, and not knowing the specific situation, it's really a hard question to, to address. So I would really encourage that person not to be anonymous, but to follow through with the administrator in their building if they're feeling that their student isn't getting the support that they need to be successful, not only in English language learning, but in, in their academics. Um, I just have a real hard time trying to put a scope around that because there's too many open variables for me personally at this point, so. Yeah, and I think if we go down the table, we're all, I don't wanna be redundant and say the same thing. It, it's a, I don't know exactly what the question is. I know in the last, um, six years that I've been on the board, we've seen our English language learner population increase exponentially. And I know that we've seen um, our teachers uh, increase in that need as well to support those kids. If there's a need or, you know, a concern that we don't have the right staffing or we don't have the right services for those kids, I would encourage whoever the anonymous person is that put this in or anyone with a concern or question to talk to their child's teacher, to talk to the administrator, to share exactly what you feel it is that the child is lacking. Um, you know, we, we want to make sure that we're supporting all our kids and giving them the support they need. But I, um, I it's hard to say. There's just specifics in this question that are hard to really. Hey, I... Oh, <coughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, ju I just wanted to mention that um, 
when Dr. Valen gave a presentation in January on the academic intervention services, there was also discussion of that, that including English language learners and having additional supports for them. So I, I'll just say that in addition to what has already been said. And just quickly, I, I do know a little bit about it. So when a child is considered an English language learner, they're tested, they go through a series, mm -hmm. and they, they end up at a level. There's expanding, transitioning, and with that comes the number of minutes and services. Mm -hmm. So if a parent feels that their child would need more services, which sounds like it might be needs, the best thing to do is to seek out the guidance counselor and the principal because just like any student, we do have different intervention services to help children, learning labs, the academic intervention services before school, during school, after school. So we can meet their needs beyond just the ELL component. Absolutely. And we all know that Commissioner's Regulations Part 154 are very um, prescriptive on what we must provide for students, but um, the board and the district realize the need and we realize the increased level of services we have to provide to our English language learners, so much so that we decided to hire for a director of multilingual education. So that position has been posted and we'll be conducting interviews very shortly because we know there's an increased need in our district and that po uh, the population is growing in our district. And we realize that. So we are addressing that also. I just wanted to add too that we do have a board policy around this issue because board policy is really what our focus is as board members and then the superintendent carries that out. So 8280 is our board policy related to English language learners. It outlines um, the philosophy of our programming, the screening procedures, <laughs> the programming itself. It also provides professional learning opportunities for teachers and assistants in the schools, and not just the TESOL teachers themselves, but for, for all teachers, there's uh, professional learning strategies available because um, I know as a former teacher that what benefits my L students benefits every child in my classroom. Um, and, I, and I also remember Dr. Bielan sharing when she did her program with us at the board meeting was that we offer a summer school program specific for English language learners. So, th so that in and of itself is not a requirement of the state, Correct. which shows, we, you know, we do in some ways exceed what the state requirements are. I'm not sure if the person that sent this was a parent or a staff member, but regardless, I think, you know, future conversations would be beneficial. Anyone else? I mean, I just have one comment. Some of our English learners come from diverse backgrounds and having the new diversity policy in place would actually help them better uh, integrate into the class, probably give them more opportunity to interact with their friends and hopefully will break down the barrier that's preventing them from le I mean, learning at a much faster rate. Good point. Norman. I hate to start and end with me, but you know we had this historical data on our desks, and on page 10, it says that we have 505 uh, English uh, language learners as such, uh, and of that group, 65, about 65% 65 have been in our schools less than three years, uh, and then we have a next group that's been here uh, between receiving services from four to six years, and that's about 28%. And then we have about 7% who've been here uh, for longer than six years receiving services. And it says, uh, these students were born in 34 different countries and speak 39 languages. And I know through my historic times on the board, uh, how many more students uh, who are English language learners we are getting. And um, yeah, that's that's significant because when I met with um, Assemblywoman McMahon in Senator Rath's office, that was something I spoke about because it had to do with our state aid being based on the 2000 census data. And back in 2000, which is quite a ways away, right? We only had 111 ELL students. I was able to pull that from the archive data from NYSED. But what was the number that you just gave for, for this year? 505. Right. That's significant. And we know from the board perspective, when we approve the consent agenda items, we've, we've improved 
or approved quite mm -hmm. a few TCL teachers over the years. Yes. You know, every every year we're adding to that. Um, so I I appreciate the question. Um, I'm satisfied with what I that we're definitely meeting state requirements. I would love to you know have a conversation with the individual to find out you know, what the deeper concern is. If I may, quick plug, what Dr. Lippman is referencing is our new historical and statistical highlights brochure that's available electronically on our district website. It's just a, a quick and easy place for anyone needing historical and statistical information about the district to access. So that's where Dr. Lippman was reading it from. And you can download it on our district website. If you go to About Us and click on the very top, you'll be able Nick is going to show you at district profile, scroll down, historical and statistical highlights. It's available there. You. There. All right. We will now um, ask Thank any you, one individual who would like to be next. <clears throat> Please come to the podium and introduce yourself. Honored to be here. Um, I won't remain anonymous. My name is Richard Anderson, Dr. McCleary. It's been a while. It's good to see you serving you in, in this capacity. Um, it was interesting because so far we've had two speakers. It's been 25 minutes. So I hope everybody gets the chance to be heard. Um, I couldn't make a recommendation. You know, one one person from the board could speak if they miss it. You know, another person can chime in, but that that was almost 11 minutes for uh, uh, answering Anonymous's uh, question. So, and I know there's a lot of people here and probably online or, or whatever. So I'll make mine as, as quick as possible. Um, I had a thought about the construction uh, projects, uh, $68 million. Uh, it's to maintain state funding and to, you know, deal with the debt. And, and now there's... Uh, other funds available, you know, for the future. But I have also been made aware from my um, child that there's water fountains he can't use in transit middle because they have lead, uh, high levels of lead. Um, so if you're, you know, looking to uh, have summer school programs in elementary schools where the air conditioning is required, that's great. But um, I think you guys should all be aware that drinking water, uh, kids are being banned from using water fountains um, because of high lead levels in, in the water testing. So with that, um, the budget presentation, it's a very macro level thing and, and it's an interesting thing and it's great what you guys uh, have presented and uh, I, I forget Tom's last name, but um, I really liked everything that he's been able to do for the district. Um, but it does, it doesn't get into the macro level. So what I'm, I've thought about was $15 million in CARES Act funding. Apparently that was just one year. Um, I did the math on that. That means every student should have spent per capita about $1,300. 20% of that you guys know is mandated for learning loss. So if, if I'm a parent and I look at a child I, I don't know about you know how you move six million dollars here and five million dollars there and and we're planning to absorb these costs in year three. I'm thinking the federal government wants at least thirteen hundred dollars invested in one child. So so you, you do the macro budget presentation, but where is where is any money? I mean, you know, I, I know my my um, child didn't arrive at school with a mask a couple of times. Well, there's there's 10 to 15 bucks worth of masks you guys bought. You know, well, where's the other $1,285? You know, and in 20 to 30% of that spent on learning loss. So if there's one new person at the school, are they providing $300 worth of services to my son? I don't think that anybody up here, I, I don't know if you can answer it. I, I, and please don't everybody try to answer it. Um, because I'd like everybody else to have an opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, is there anyone? I do. I, uh, Mr. Anderson, <laughs> that $15 million figure, where did you get that from? Um, the, when, when it's mentioned that the city of, of Buffalo got $100 million 
in CARES Act funding. Maybe it was only nine for Williamsville, but it could, I, I I'd also heard it was as high as 15. Oh, for, for the, um, yeah, the, the federal dollars that came in addition uh, through the COVID bills. Right. No, no, I know exactly what money you're talking about. I'm wondering where you got that figure from, because that figure, because I, I want the public to realize that figure is not correct. Okay. But if you go on our website, because what we did do, being transparent, we want to make sure that all of the funds that were spent from CARES Act, from ESSER 2, were actually listed. The FS10s are listed online, so you can see how the money was spent, how you can see how any money that was geared to unfinished learning was also directed, right? Enhancing the summer program, the learning labs that are put in place into the school, the STEM activities that are put in place into the school. So all of that money is accounted for. And if you like, um, if we have your information, I can email it to you, but we can also make it very prevalent. It's on our website. All that information is there, how every single dollar was spent. And we have to send in reports to the federal government and to um, NICE at New York State Education Department detailing how that money is spent and then what the return on that money is. So that's how that, that money was spent. It is very detailed on there. I'm wondering if Nick can pull that up really quickly because it's under it's under departments, uh, business, no, and help, American you. Rescue Plan. And the twenty percent for learning loss, we can we know was spent on academic intervention service supports as well as learning lab teachers. Um, we also, it, yep, there it is right there. So when you click on the plan itself, it does have a breakdown. I just want to bring this attention to the community. As far as the um, claim about the drinking water at transit, I want you to, want to thank you for bringing that to our attention. I can share that. As a board, we do receive regular facility updates and that Mr. Tom Matursi, our assistant superintendent for business and finance is also the individual that oversees our facilities. He has presented multiple times to the board um, because you know, keeping the records on drinking on the lead in the drinking water is a requirement of local School districts. So that's been shared with us frequently. It's, we've been told at the board table that the cleanest water to drink from in the district is the water from the from the water fountains that have been renovated that are now uh, water bottle filling stations, which, which is what I do. I come in with an empty bottle and fill it up right here. So if there is a station, a water filling station at Transit Middle, that isn't functioning, thank you for bringing that to our attention so we can look into that. All right. As we continue, um, back to Mr. Biscalia. This should be fast, so it should make Mr. Anderson happy. Uh, whether or not they will be accept we will be accepting foreign exchange students in 2022-2023 from Ryan Henze. We'll be accepting foreign exchange students. Yes, we will. Okay. We, we met about that earlier, and yes, we will. Back to in-person. Next individual who would like to come to the podium and speak. Nope. <laughs> State your name, please. My name is Molly Armbruster. Um, I have a child at High Middle and Maple West. First off, I do want to thank you, Dr. Brown Hall. I've had a couple of random questions. Mm -hmm. Just to clarify some things on Facebook that were kind of floating around and you've gotten back to me really quickly before it started spiraling. Anytime I can do that, I, I think. I appreciate it. And it totally. says a lot. And thank you. My question for the board is, what is your protocol if a parent questions something they see displayed in a school and in turn, the teacher retaliates against the parent? Do you have in place an anti-retaliation or anti-harassment policy in place for teachers that do this? Do you, it would be part of our code of conduct. <clears throat> Okay. Have you read our code of conduct? It's online? Yes, I have. Okay. And how do you address it with the parents? Well, as a parent, if you're being, if there is retaliation, I would suggest that you go to the principal of the school where this I is did. occurring. And then at that level, you would, you would move up. So, I did. Okay. So where are you? My response the, was, we have received your email. And who did you last speak with? Miss Leatherbarrel, Dr. Brown Hall and also the principal at the middle school that it took place at. Oh. This was back in July. I have it on my phone. I can send July it to you. July 2021. Okay. I would encourage you that if this happens again, and it probably will, that you would contact the parent personally 
this will not be tolerated. Another thing I encourage parents, there's no reason you cannot be in your school anymore. The vaccinations have been lifted. Get in your school, look at the walls, go in the classroom, look at the walls, ask the teacher questions. There may be some things you may not agree with and there may be some things you do. But this needs, if you have a question, you should be able to ask a teacher, a superintendent, the president, or any other teacher without fear of retaliation or harassment, because this is ridiculous and it was handled completely inappropriately. And if you have any questions any further, I'd be ha happy to answer them for you. Thank you. Thank you. Back to Mr. Viscalia. You know, in, in terms of can, that, can, have, I, can I just? Yeah, I know. I just, okay. like in terms of that, if you have evidence or things like that with a teacher, there's a pro policy, you know, state policy called a 3020A, where teachers are, could be disciplined under that. Unfortunately, I don't I, because my work didn't want to get involved. So, so I'm, I'm just stating that there's things that can be done from a parent standpoint that if, if you research that and look into it, there are policies that if a teacher is in the wrong, there can be discipline. How, you know, brought up okay. against that teacher. Just so you know, it's, it's, so you I understand you that, but I know how much you all make, and this is also your job as well. Okay. We, we, don't, we don't make any, anything. Right. But what I'm saying is that th it's ridiculous the way that it was handled, and it needs to be going we, forward, it needs to be handled differently. There needs to be a phone call to the parent. You can sit there and smile, Mrs. Leather Barrel. So may I, re may I respond to that? Uh, yeah, I'm going to make a comment. Too. Yes. So um, I don't recall what your email, if it was from July, um, normally in terms of investig investigating some sort of harassment, that would not be the responsibility of the Board of Education. That is, That would be the responsibility of district administration. So I just wanted to clarify that. So in terms of, I'm sure you did get some sort of response from the Board of Education, but that isn't you know, we do not do investigations. So that would not fall on our plate. So um, again, I, you would work up the train of command and maybe Dr. Brownhall can pipe in here. Yeah, I, and I, I'm, I am recollecting the entire situation and I don't know that this is the appropriate forum to even go into detail, but I will follow up with Mrs. Armbruster. And um, it did happen in July. And a lot of it happened outside of the school, as she did indicate up there. Her work did not want to get involved. So there's a lot of other details that we don't want to get into right here. I hope you all will appreciate that. All right. All right. Uh, next question was, uh, how will the district examine and correct the disparity in class size between college credit courses and the rigorous AP courses? Is there a way we, you know, examine class sizes with those two, Dr. Brown Hall? Can you repeat that question? Yep. Is, can we, uh, how does the district examine and correct the disparity in class sizes between college credit courses and AP courses? So how do we? I guess, I mean, the only thing I can think to, to say to that one is that we do receive um, at the request of the board a enrollment report for different classes and we've had it broken down to be very specific so that we can see the number of students attending each class um you know that there's different reasons for that 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 data can be used for staffing projections for the next year but it can also be used to you know to, to take a deeper dive if we get into a situation in the future where we might need to do budget reductions we might look at some of those courses and say, you know, which classes could we perhaps offer every other year? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that would be, that, that's something that colleges and universities do frequently where they don't always offer every single course every semester. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that is in line with what the individual was, was asking, but that is what I can offer. Any other comments? I, you know, as far as disparities between one class and another, it's hard to hard to say is it an, an enrollment who's choosing to attend a class versus the other. And we do have the guidelines of class size, so some of there may be some variability there, just based purely on um, <coughs> choice. 
Great. Back to a next in-person speaker. Hello, just state your name, please. Hi, I'm Deb Rogers. Um, I have a question. Um, in the fall, there was a policy that came out and it, it did no longer allowed parents who were unvaccinated to come in and volunteer in the school. And I'm just wondering, I did try to find out if that was a Erie County Department of Health policy or a district policy. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that was a district policy. It was. Okay. So um, unfortunately, you know, New York State has done a one size fits all over the last two years with everything from vaccination to masking in the schools. And I guess I'm more just encouraging all of you when this happens again and make no doubt that it will. <laughs> um, and I think that we've gone past science to political science. So I have no doubt that probably, you know, right after the elections over in November that we'll see um, some of these protocols being instituted again in our schools. And I would encourage you then as boards to not go above and beyond what um, has been strangulated upon all the parents and students from New York State Department of Health. And by doing that said policy, um, you have uh, excluded many parents who would otherwise be in the school volunteering um, and being with their children and, and if we're really talking equity and inclusion as a district, that policy is just one of the worst policies to support equity and inclu ex inclusion. Um, if you are a parent in the district, which I am, I have volunteered since my children have been there with PTA stories, lunch volunteering, and I was basically shut out of all of that while other parents were allowed to come in all because of a vaccination status. And uh, I just don't think it's inclusive and I don't think it's fair. And um, I would hope that now that is no longer a thing. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And um, it, let me ask perhaps this, it, when in fact those policies are in again, which I have no doubt that they will be probably late fall, December. I think so. Um, I do. I, I know that uh, the village of Williamsville received 10,000 masks and we have those sitting at our fire department right now. So um, I'm not sure unless I'm supposed to be handing those out for home improvement projects, why I would be delivered those as a municipal government entity. So I'm assuming that there is something in the pipeline, um, oh. you know, short of having like a crystal ball in front of me. I, right. I'm just, you know, I have 10,000 masks sitting at the fire department. <laughs> so, you know, what am I to conclude that perhaps this isn't over for us and our children? And, um, and I would just encourage all of you, and I know this is like the most thankless jobs at, at times, you're, you're unpaid, you're sitting here as volunteers, and I really get that. But I would encourage you to think about what is right for the, for the children and for the parents. And, um, you know, don't go above and beyond what is already being instituted upon our children and allow for those parents who are such a strong support system for the teachers and everyone in the building and for their children, please don't shut us out. That's Thank all. you, Thank Mayor you. Rogers. Does anyone else have a comment for Mayor Rogers? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next question is about uh, athletics. Um, school policies state that seventh and eighth graders can uh, participate in JV and varsity level sports. Um, their concern um, is that at what point are we going to kind of stop letting these athletes take positions away from, you know, 10th, 11th and 12th graders um, in those certain sports? Um, is there going to be fair opportunity for them to be in that sport? Um, I don't know if anyone has comments on that. There's already policies involved in this. I know that 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 there's, you know, letters sent home from you know, our athletic director. Um, I don't know if anyone has comments on that. I just have one. I, I really don't feel that the board should really um, respond or get involved in this because there are different things that take place within the school and that we're abiding by with the state. Uh, some of the eighth graders not allowed to be on a JV varsity sport unless they take and pass the selective classification test. Mm -hmm. So there are certain criteria and requirement for them to even be eligible. And then you're getting into a tryout process. So that is something that if a parent is concerned, I would direct them to our athletic director and the coach. 
Right. And that, and just to piggyback, that's the, the best point because these seventh and eighth graders are allowed to participate in the JV and the varsity if they pass the certain requirements. And so we don't want to limit our students from that. And that's why it is allowed in New York State. So thank you. And I'm just referring to our policy. That would be policy 7420 for sports and athletic programs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> and back to the next in-person person. Person, person. State your name, please. I'll be that, I'll be that person. Okay. Uh, Kim Rice Weber, thank you guys for allowing us the ability to actually have feedback from you. That's very <laughs> nice. Thank you. Uh, so today I have questions um, regarding the implementation of CRS or culturally responsive sustaining education in the district. Uh, these are actually questions that I posed to you, Dr. Brown Hall, in an email I sent on October 29th. On November 2nd, you responded that you couldn't answer my questions through email and that, quote, when we move forward and begin to examine curriculum and any changes that we will move toward in Williamsville, there will be greater opportunity for question and answer. Almost five months later, that opportunity has not come to fruition. In fact, in your community update during the January 11th Board of Education meeting, two months after our email exchange, you stated and your presentation shows that CRS has already been introduced to all schools. Additionally, seed training was already given to all principals and assistant principals. For anyone who is unaware, SEED stands for Seeking Education, Equity, and Diversity and was founded by Ms. Peggy McIntosh, author of the pivotal paper, White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. My specific questions are focused on one of the four principles of CRS titled Inclusive Curriculum and Assessment. The framework defines the principle in this way. Quote, the inclu inclusive curriculum and assessment elevate historically marginalized voices. It includes opportunities to learn about power and privilege in the context of various communities and empowers learners to be agents of positive social change it provides the opportunity to learn about perspectives beyond one's own scope. It works towards dismantling systems of biases and inequities and decentering dominant ideology ideologies in education. To understand the implemented changes to the curriculum, I'm interested in your reading of that principle. So my question is really, can you help me please understand what that specific principle means in practice with our children and our students? I understand that this could be a long conversation uh, and I don't mean to take up all the time. And so I appreciate that I might get not get these answers today. However, I would appreciate a deeper discussion as previously promised. Yeah. And you know, it, it won't take long, but I do want to go back to your email and to what I shared with you. So in my update in January, if you recall, what I said is that the CRS curriculum was introduced to our administrators. So it's our responsibility to introduce and make them familiar with the CRS curriculum, what it entails and things of that nature. We have not begun a deep dive as a district into the culturally responsive and sustaining education framework as far as training teachers yet, reviewing our curriculum and looking at that. That's that it. will be a part of our district-wide DEI plan. Yes. So those all go together. What I don't want to do is piecemeal anything related to CR-S or DEI in the district, because my goal is to make sure we take it slowly, develop a plan for Williamsville by Williamsville. So that's why for the past two weeks, I've also asked for parental and community input to be part of the DEI team so that we can move that work forward. We're going to take it slow. We're going to make sure it's developed for our district just so that it's sustainable in the future. You bring up very good questions. And what we have to do as a district is to make sure that we're all on the same page. Correct. And so that's why I didn't want to piecemeal the answer also, because what you want, I understand our specifics. And I can't give those to you right now. When we unpack CRS as a district and really examine our curriculum and what it means to have students and um, cultures that have been marginalized represented in our curriculum, then we can have a deeper discussion. What I will tell you we have done is when we look at our libraries and our classrooms, that is one of the things we've done is to make sure that everyone when selecting a book to read during their you know, independent reading time can pick a book that represents them. And so we use the windows and mirrors, right? So any book that you choose can be a window 
or it can be a mirror. So that's the first step. Now, as far as the curriculum we'll be teaching, that's something that will take additional training, additional steps. We don't want to piecemeal it, and we don't want to have teachers teaching something that they, number one, aren't very solid in. And so, so, you're, that's so, why you're saying, so you're saying in regards to the library, you're saying that pieces of the CRS framework have been implemented in, in our schools? No, that's not what I said. You're not what, okay. I said in our libraries, what we've done is make sure we have a diversified library so that students are able to pick a book and see themselves in that book. Okay. That's what I was saying for that okay. part. So then to answer my question, do you, well, I suppose maybe you're, you won't. The framework, you're not going to define or under or help us to understand in this community forum where we're allowed to get your feedback. Can I what you that? feel about what you what you understand that principle, that inclusive curriculum and assessment principle to state. If I if I could jump in, oh, I think it, I think what you're asking, if I'm understanding correctly, sort of relates to our policy, which was the one we approved in October. So yep. that's the DEI policy. It's 3431 for anyone here in attendance. So a portion of that, after it goes through like the definitions of diversity, equity, and inclusion. If you scroll down, it talks about teaching and learning. And there's six <coughs> components. And it says that to implement a culturally responsive sustaining education framework that embeds the ideas of diversity, equity, and inclusion, we want to create a student-centered learning environment that, number one, affirms cultural identities, two, fosters positive academic outcomes, Three, develop students' abilities to connect across lines of difference. Four, elevate historically marginalized voices. Five, empower students as agents of social change. And six, contribute to individual student engagement, learning, growth, and achievement through the cultivation of critical thinking. Correct. I've read all of the policies yeah. front to back. My question is, how can we have a conversation if you cannot clearly define your terms. So I think that what Dr. Ron Hall was, was saying was that we're forming, we're taking this slowly, right? We approve the underlining policy. The board is also going to be receiving some, <coughs> some learning opportunities at, at our future retreat. We're having one of our instructional specialists from the district come in and share with the board what's been shared with school administrators. It just doesn't so seem like a very a difficult question. Can you define historically marginalized voices? Historic oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, I didn't. We can definitely okay, define that's what that. I'm asking for definitions of these words that we're talking about. So that, so that, wasn't actually, your that wasn't your first question. Can you help me understand what it means in practice with our students? Absolutely. So when you say marginally, De marginally defined voices, what that is are that are cultures or groups of people that have been underrepresented when we're teaching about history. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, and if I could, if I could just do a round robin, it's one word answer. I promise I won't take one of your time. If you could all answer this question, do you think that parents should be involved in the curriculum being taught to their children? Dr. Lippman. Yes. Parents are going to be involved in this committee, so yes. So do you, you think they should be involved? But we have state guidelines, so within the scope of the state guidelines of that we have to follow, of course, parents will be involved. Parents are involved in all of our curriculum committees currently. Okay. Yes, we have um, vehicles set up so parents can give input. Yeah. Great. Yes, it's already happening with curriculum council and then the additional committees that we are putting Perfect. in place. Perfect. Yes. 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 They already are involved. Yes. Yes. Great to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Back to Mr. Biscalia. Kind of ties into what we were just talking about this question. Uh, what is Winslow Center School District's position on CRT? And are there any plans on incorporating CRT into the curriculum? Can students opt out of these programs? I can just start. I, Go ahead. I, Go ahead. I believe Buffalo is the only school that is, <laughs> and I might even be wrong about that, uh, implemented CRT. And I hope people know there are two. You 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 are you are wrong. I want to stop you right there. Said, yeah, wrong. because yeah, yeah. most people don't even know what CRT two, is. There's right. right. Two definitions. It, it depends. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. And, and, yeah. No. 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 And CR, CRT. Now, there's a difference between co critical race theory and examining examining the role of race and history critically. Right. 
two different things. So CRT is taught at a college level. It's a law course. It's not something that we're teaching here in Williamsville. Will we be examining the curriculum to make sure that those marginalized voices, as Kim stated, are um, represented in the <laughs> curriculum? Yes, we will be doing that. However, it's not CRT. That's, that's what I was going to say. There's yeah, and critical this, race theory, and then there's critical responsive teaching. Too. Right. And um, the Board of Regents made it very clear that CRT is not part of the New York State curriculum. Uh, that's what I wanted to share. Okay, I, I'm sorry. I, we had we saw this question out of time, so I was able to look it up. It was actually Chancellor Dr. Lester Young uh, mm -hmm. who spoke on this, um, and I pulled up his article in Education Weekly. Um, I know as an educator that that CRT is not taught in K through 12 schools, right? Um, but Dr. Young, who was one of our regent chancellors, he said specifically, our policy, New York State Board of Regents policy on DEI, is not an attempt to teach critical race theory. Critical race theory is not our theory for action. Our theory for action is cultural responsiveness. CRT is not taught in K through 12 schools in New York State. And so that was directly from the Board of Regents um, with Chancellor, Chancellor Dr. Uh, Lester, Lester Young. Young. Mm -hmm. um, he also went on to talk about how, you know, the role of critical thinking is important and that when we have these higher level conversations, we consider the age of the student. So the um, exploration of higher education theories is confined to higher education, graduate schools, as well as professional schools. So these are the places where you would be taking these types of courses and having these more higher level thinking discussions and dialogues. So, you know, so when we get a question like, why is this being taught? We got to back up the train because it's not. And I think that's really important. And, and when we form the DEI committees, I think that's where those, you asked a really great, great question about how can we have these dialogues, right? We don't want to be like this with each other. We want to just be able to share freely what our concerns is, what our, what our fears are, what our beliefs are for our kids. We all want our kids to feel welcomed and loved and safe. And we want to have a little bit of control as parents, right? I get that. And um, I think when we get these committees going in the buildings, I think we're going to start to see that shift. And I'm really hopeful, hopeful for that. And I'm hopeful that you'll, you'll join up as well. I would just say, you know, you use initials to, um, you know, as abbreviations or whatever. And, when you have ones, you know, that is similar, you know, uh, people can misinterpret them. You know, you think if you had a, you know, an idea that might be looked at negatively, like a product, like Facebook to change its name or any product to change its name, and it maybe um, they would have used different, different letters so people don't kind of look at things negatively. When you think of CRT these days. When I worked in Buffalo public schools, and I would say it was, this was like 10 years ago, we had professional development in CRT at the time was critically responsive teaching. Yes, yes. Now they've, yes, they've right. changed the acronym. We know yes. education's a lot of alphabet. But the other CRT is getting That was more fantastic publicity. training. Me, especially as a white female working in an urban setting, it was really beneficial for me to learn to be more cult culturally responsive and to, to know like how to go about that. Yeah. So uh, thank you for that. All right. Um, next person from the audience. Identify yourself, please. Sure. Uh, I'm Tim Terrell, a parent of uh, three Williamsville students. Um, so I had no idea that the uh, topic of my conversation was going to be in almost every single uh, speaker's thing and uh, the two words, diversity and inclusion. Um, so uh, I think this kind of ties together a bunch of things. So um, so I, I was taking the, the, the bend that the diversity and equity or diversity and inclusion principles can and should be used in communication. And some of the things that were just said here, there are many of us who felt marginalized as voices throughout this year, especially during the pandemic, with all kinds of things relating to mandates that some were out of your control, some were within your control, some you went above and beyond and did certain things. Um, and, 
you know, I think that there's some room for improvement. Um, so, uh, all right. So here, I just want to out of order a little bit. Um, so I believe that the principles can be reflected in how we handle the community collaboration between the district and parents and specifically in regards to curriculum and uh, education. And I understand that uh, this uh, forum here, the community forum, is an attempt aimed at that, to sort of have a dialogue, but it is complicated. As the first guy stated, it takes 10 minutes to have a dialogue. So I understand there's complexities involved in what I'm suggesting that we try to do more of these kinds of things. And it sounds like you have lots of boards going on with lots of parents involved. Um, but uh, I don't know, hopefully there's room to do more of this. Um, but I do have some examples <laughs> that I'd like to point out. Um, so one of the early Board of Education meetings, the board decided that it was okay to read a letter from a parent and uh, 20 other supposedly medical professionals that were in strongly in favor of masking. And um, in the closing remarks of the letter, it stated um, for the board not to listen to the vocal minority against masking. Personally, I think that is an extremely anti-inclusive message that the board adopted when it read that letter aloud. So that's that's one problem. Um, so let's see here. Also the fact of like vocal minority, it's kind of a statement thrown around because the board specifically stated that you did not do a survey, which is just one basic form of, of where is the spectrum of parents? Where are they on these issues? So um, to state that the vocal minority, that's unfactual. Uh, second example is I submitted a letter of my own about something regarding the vaccination information on the company or the district website. We had a short dialogue by email and then it just silenced, you know, it, nothing got read at the board of ed meeting. I thought it was important, but apparently it didn't make a certain level. So I'm urging the board to really think about, and you guys are scrutinized a lot. And as it was said before, it's a thankless job in a lot of regards, but I'd really strongly urge you to think about these basic principles that we talk about all the time, but a lot of us don't see it that way. I feel marginalized. I feel like the things that I come up here and speak about, I get a thank you letter and that's it. Nothing like, wow, it was thoughtful. We've, thought, we've been thinking about this or been thinking about that. I don't know how other um, family members are feeling or uh, parents, but I feel as though we don't have a great dialogue here, especially around the hot topics. And they get hotter and hotter when we don't have a dialogue. I don't have the answer, um, but this is in your guys' realm. It's what you do. So I'm suggesting and urging you to come up with some solution that has more of these types of things, may, may be focused around masking because like November, December is going to come around. It's going to it's gonna happen again. And then we're going to have these mandates and people are going to be upset. And uh, I feel like that's just a bad way to lead. So um, again, I don't, I'm not on the board, so I can only imagine how hard it is. I thank you for the time you put into everything. I just hope that we can try to find a way to have better communication and everyone involved. Thank I you. will ask one question, Mr. Terrell. Oh, Over hi. Here. Sorry, my Sorry. glasses aren't on. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you're making certainly very valid uh, discussions about we should do more of these kinds of things. Are you able to give us some specifics of what you would like to see done? Sure. Um, okay. Yeah. So, mm, so masking. So the beginning of the school year, lots of districts did send out a survey, but it was survey on a masking. Sur oh, a sur yeah, survey on what's your opinion as a parent? Do you feel your children should be masked or not masked? You know, something along those lines. Okay. And it was specifically stated that we Williamsville did not do that because we're not going to run things this way. I.e., we don't care what you think, or whatever it means but we're just left to be like okay so there's no communication there at all that's just one example another right. example would can be i can i say something yeah sure go ahead mr tim because i don't want it ever to be thought of that we don't care right sure the masking survey was a moot point so i i understand you know if people want data that we can do something with right there's nothing we could have done with that masking data because whether parents wanted it or not, right, it was something we had to follow. So that's the reason why it wasn't to be dismissive of you or the parents in the district. So I, I don't want you to take it that way because sure. that wasn't the intent. Okay, that's fair. However, the vocal minority, as stated in the letter that was endorsed by the board when the letter was read aloud, to state that the vocal minority against masking 
the survey would have been important to identify that likely it wasn't going to be a vocal minority. It was probably not 20% of the parents saying, yeah, no, thanks. But we don't know. We will never know how many were for and how many were against. And that very topic was a huge hot topic all pandemic long because that information was just never gotten because you felt your hands were tied and we're told that we have to do this. Therefore, we're not going to ask what you think. So, again, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you're right. Maybe because there's nothing that could be done, you didn't want to send out the survey. Uh, but I don't know. It just no. There's too many hot topics, unfortunately, mm -hmm. right, that we all and have to There will always be. You're absolutely there, right. There are. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and, and one other thing, actually, sorry, and I know others probably want to go. If there's a way, and I think today was the first time I've seen through text about like the board meetings and stuff. If there are, um, uh, hopefully you guys are going to use that all the time more for all board um, I meetings. Use what? Do. We do. The e alerts every, every, every month. <laughs> every month. Yeah. Maybe I'm just starting to get them now because I must have signed up more recently. Um, but I, I found that I had to go through the website to figure out when things were happening as opposed to a WITS email or a text um, stating that community expression was coming up. Okay. So, Can I ask a follow-up question? Are, are you saying that you feel like you're getting too many communications? No, about other things, but maybe not about how to participate in, you know, a CRSE parent committee meeting, a parent committee or a community discussion about other important topics that have come up. I don't know where to look for those and I don't see them coming through. I see weekly updates. I see other things coming through the text updates, but other things that are important to the community, I don't see coming through those channels. I don't know what channels they come through, but I don't see them. Yeah. The, the community update, the weekly community updates are where a lot of that information is. Dr. Brown held does a really good job and he's been in the last, I think it's been at least three times that he's mentioned the um, diversity, equity, and inclusion committees and trying to get people to Okay. And, you know, so go go back to one of those and check it out because the email's in there. If you're interested in participating, who to send the email to to say, sign me up. I want to be there. So. Okay, great. And, and yeah, they thanks. come multiple ways. So they, they come to your WITS box. They'll come to your email and they'll come also through your text if you sign up for that. Okay. We, we do those different yeah, modalities because we figure, you know, hopefully the parent will see it from one of those angles. Um, if you have another idea as to how to push out information, we're always looking for ways to be able to get that information to you. I can tell you that, like my husband will say, my phone will go off and his his phone will go off and he'll go, it's the district, you right. know, and, and so he doesn't read it because he knows that I'm going to tell him what it says. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> um, but then, it, then it'll be on WITS and it'll be on the website. And then before you know it, it's coming through my email and my phone. And so and Nick. Tweets it out too. Yeah. Oh, I saw it three times today. <laughs> tweets, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I, <laughs> my wife says the same thing, and then she, in a way, it just brought up what she said. So she maybe she doesn't want me to say it, but oh well, I'll just get yelled at at home. Um, uh, sometimes she does say it's like almost overwhelming that, that what she gets. Like it's this, 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 and this, and then she forgets where something she might find is important. Right. Um, which is kind of what you're saying. And then, right. and then it goes by the wayside, like, Oh man, I wanted to be on that committee, but I forgot because I got a, B, C and D set. So maybe there is a better way we can streamline that or what our community members feel is important. Maybe a list on the email of this is what will be, I'm just trying to think off the top mm -hmm. of my head. I don't know I if we could do this, but I think maybe it's something we could all discuss. Or maybe we can encourage parents to join the communication subcommittee so that we can get all those wonderful ideas about communication between the district and parents yeah. written down because it's a strategic plan goal and an action item. So maybe we could do that. Mm -hmm. Sure. I yeah. think that's sure. smart because I know when we had the strategic plan, we were able to get seven additional parents added, eight, eight additional mm -hmm. parents added. But if we look at the size of our district, I would have expected we would have had a lot more. I would have hoped that we would have had a lot more, right? Um, I do understand that they meet during the school day and that can be a barrier at, at, at some times. But I feel like as a board, as a board member, sometimes I'm racking my brain thinking what else could we do? Mm -hmm. So if you have specific ideas, please share them at any time. It doesn't have to be here in this format. You can email the board at any time with an idea. 
Sure. Yeah, I think the information overload is a factor because I don't always read the updates if they're little videos. I know they're short, but it's mm -hmm. always like I don't have necessarily time. And that's on me Understood. to no, yeah, Understood. it's on me to have done it. So, um, but yeah, what was the the board that you said? The, it, uh, the subcommittee is a communication. It's one of the strategic uh, strategic plan goals, and they have separate committees. So every um, school, many many schools already have like a communication committee, and they'll be filling out those action plans. But you can even look at the strategic plan online and see what the goals are for the communication team. And I know that um, Mr. Filipowski will be um, incorporating a lot of that into the communication plan for the district. You know, so absolutely, we want to make sure we get everyone's ideas on that. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just one last thing, you know, in terms of Board of Education information, you go to the Board of Education page on the district website, and those dates are up at the very beginning of the year for the entire year. So you can just add them to your calendar right away, and you'll always know when the next board meeting is going to be. So. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we continue, I'm looking at the clock, and it's 9 o'clock, and we had started out saying that that would be the end of our forum. So I guess I would ask for a poll of the board if you feel we should continue. Dr. McClure, could we maybe ask um, if it's okay for a show of hands from the audience, how many people would still like to speak? Let's start with that. If you'd still like to speak, can you just raise your hand? So, so I see one, two, two, two hands. I think we can definitely Anybody do that, right? hiding behind there. I will note we have not done any, any Zoom. Okay. Oh. Um, yeah, we're zooming. Okay. Well, why don't we take our two people in person okay. here, and then we can maybe do a couple Zooms. Would it make sense to do Zoom first since we haven't done them at all and they've been waiting all this time? Just a suggestion. Sure. All right. Okay. Just, That's uh, the bill of the board? Okay. Yeah, but I'd like to get to the two people who raised their hands. Um, okay. So if we're Zooming, if you could please at home uh, put up your virtual hand so that um, Mr. Filipowski can see who's who has a question. I think that's a good idea to see who is out there yeah. who has a question. Yeah. If not, then we can just get back to it. I, I propose we definitely say to get the yes. two individuals in the audience. Do we need to vote? Do we need to vote on that? Or no. Just, no, I think, think, all, I think we're all in agreement. Yes. Yeah. All raising our hands. It's an informal thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no get somebody from the audience. No. Oh. One hand is up. Hand is up. Brenda? Doesn't know how to do the hand. Last name? Uh, doesn't say. Beltstein? Brenda Beltstein? Hello. You can hear us? <laughs> Brenda, you have to unmute. I'm wondering if perhaps she walked away. Yeah, maybe. Oh. I don't know. No. Um, so okay. we go on and come back. Yep, let's take yeah, If she raises her hand, I think we can go to the. To okay. Um, we will continue with one of the two individuals who raised their hands. And then when that's finished, we'll go back to Brenda online. So uh, either of the two individuals who raised their hand. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan Rich. I'm a father in the district. Um, you know, real quick, uh, just for clarification, uh, I know that we had some other questions asked, uh, and I just did want to point out uh, I know we are still developing our DEI plan in the district, but we did bring a group into the district that is publishing materials on white privilege and male privilege. So just to be clear, we did we did pay that group to come into the district. That's that's true. Talk correct. About, can you give specifics of Talking what about seed. Oh, okay. seed? Seed project. Yes. Oh. They came into the district, or people went to have training with them. All all I all I'm aware of is that we we gave them funds to train our staff. Not, not to train our staff. There were two people that got trained by SEED. It was part of a summer project. Fair enough. Okay. Um, so a completely different topic. Uh, Sweet Home High School has a very big parking lot. And uh, when the Board of Ed vote happens, they get 900 voters. North High School has a much smaller parking lot. And when the Board of Ed vote happens, we get four, 
five, or hopefully this year we'll get 6,000 voters, maybe even more. Um, so I know that last year, uh, you know, if you went by the school at about 4.30, you were four, five, six blocks out for 10 minutes trying to get to the school. Um, I don't know if there's something we could do, uh, maybe not this year, but next year to have multiple voting locations or move voting to Casey. You know, I know that we have events happening at North on the same day. Um, but if we moved voting to Casey, maybe we can relieve some of the congestion. Um, but, you know, just to do some math, if, if everyone who's voting is carpooling, uh, we're looking at about four cars a minute entering and leaving that parking lot over the course of the, you know, early morning and, and afternoon voting hours. Um, second thing is, um, you know, absentee ballot forms. So we do have universal absentee balloting. Uh, this year again through the school board elections. So uh, if we, if the district puts out a form, we'll share it. I know last year we put a form together and then the district put one of their own together. But either way, that's, you know, something we can address. And then the last one is... When you say we, who are you referring to? Uh, students first. So we we I, put a... I was going to make sure you're clear. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I then the, the last thing is, so uh, we can collect signatures as a community to get... Um, a student representative on the school board. We can collect 500 signatures, and and I think that's a great initiative that we could do. Uh, but the board could also just choose to put that proposition uh, up for vote. Um, I think that would be a, a good thing for the district to do it. It is kind of a complicated thing, you know. Most school districts only have one high school. Uh, obviously, Buffalo is an outlier, but Williamsville has three, and the the state laws don't have any provisions on having multiple um, students uh, to sit on the board. Um, but I think it'd be something worth investigating. Uh, so again, uh, appreciate if you guys would look into it. Thank you very much. Thank you. One have any um, comments for Mr. Rich? Okay. But I can I just make one comment about um, students. I know uh, we have a variety of groups, the Inter High Council, uh, and a number of ways that we gather information from students. Uh, I think. You know, school districts have used that, uh, having a student, you know, being an ex post facto member. Uh, sometimes, you know, when you're sitting here, it's nice to get feedback from a student uh, who might have insight that we wouldn't have. I know many of you have young people in the schools now, and that helps. For us older people, it's just reminiscing about what it might <laughs> be like. So. I will just make a comment. So I will say that we have worked extremely hard as I am a very active PTSA member. Um, and we have worked very, very hard on all of our PTSA groups, both at the middle school and high school level, as well as PTSA council to invite students to participate. We've even gone so far as doing a QR code where they can walk up and just scan it and just fill out a three question to participate to really make sure that we receive their voice. So hopefully we'll see more participation, but I will share um, for the PTSA North, we have no one. For PTSA Council, we have one, potentially two in the entire district. So I will say it's not lack of trying, but students are very busy also. Um, so we can look at their feedback, but this is a very big commitment also, and it would be difficult to have one student sitting for the entire student body. Um, so I would love to see more students participate at the PTSA subunits. Um, we have wonderful things, SIAC committee, that is all three schools, 12 to 15 students coming together with Dr. Brown Hall. So there are incredible ways that we are receiving student voice and we are continuously trying to increase their involvement as well. I just wanted to point out that Dr. McClary serves as the liaison for SIAC. SIAC is our, our student inter-high advisory council and it's an alternative to having a student on the school board because it actually maximizes the, the student voice because there's several students from each high school that participate. Mm -hmm. Superintendent Brown Hall attends along with Dr. McClary. 
they, I mean, you can speak to better than I can about what they do during the session, but we get to read the report as board members. Absolutely. And they're doing a lot right now. We actually met this morning at 8 a.m. at North also. So they have individual projects they're working on. They're, they're, they're sponsoring actually a Try High Spirit Week that will begin April 4th. One of the groups is sponsoring a senior junior share in relation to college and college applications. So they're working on a lot of things. And so we gather them together today. We'll be meeting again on April 5th at 8 a.m. in this very room to discuss um, stress relievers, especially for those seniors who are preparing to go to college, just prioritization and relieving stress and making sure you're mentally and well balanced also. Great. Just another opportunity for students, um, because I'm involved with it, is shared decision-making committees. There's those committees at each building, and then we have a district shared decision-making committee, mm -hmm. um, and students take part in that as well, So, in, um, which is starting to weave into strategic plan as it should. Um, Absolutely. That's just another place for, for student voice. Also, just to um, comment on what Mr. Rich said about the voting location, um, it is also an evening of, of the district vote. There's a band concert at North that night. And so I know we've already approved the location and everything, but in looking at my calendar, I thought that's important for us to know because that will um, take up a good piece of the parking lot as well. Okay. Unless um, my calendar is incorrect, but that's that's I what know. I. So if I'm incorrect, I apologize. That's what I have in my calendar from the district calendar. So something to just to look ahead and plan. <coughs> right. yeah. That's good. Cast Mayor Bogner. I look at how you organize the parking. Just one other quick thing. My understanding with the legislation of having a student on the board of education um, that would have to be a senior and it would have to be someone from the inner high advisory council. If one of, if an inner high advisory council exists in the district, it would need to be a member of that council that would be appointed as the student board representative. So really it, they would have to be wanting, willing and able to do that when they already devote a whole lot of time to the inner high advisory council. I appreciate you sharing that. I'm wondering if at the next inter-high advisory council, if that question could go back to the students. Is there even an interest from the students to have a student voice on the on the board of ed? Very nice. I mean, I know some some school districts do have student on their uh, board, and I mean, I think it's valuable to have student input in board, even if they don't vote on issues. And I, I know students are there in a lot of committees, even the Code of Conduct Committee and other committees, and their input is really valuable. And it, it'll be good to get students' perspective on things. And I'm sure we can work out a way in which students can rotate on the council, not limited to one student coming to all the meetings. Maybe work through science. I believe the way that the legislation yeah, uh, yeah, it's in the legislation. And I believe that the way that it's written is it's one senior per year, and it would have to come from the Inner High Advisory Council. I think that's that my understanding of the legislation. I mean, we can always right. go back to other schools that have already done this and see how they're doing it. Well, I'll, I'll just show you in start. Buffalo. So in Buffalo, we have a Inter High Advisory Council where you have students from every high school are part of Inter High. Inter High holds their elections, and they have president, vice president, um, but the president of Inter High every year is a student rep on the Board of Education. But it has to be the same person. So it has to be that one person. Yeah, um, it certainly is a topic that I think um, a few years ago we kind of talked a little bit about, and then it it kind of faded away in terms of what was legally possible and so forth. But I think because we've been hearing it again, then we can certainly at least talk about it, perhaps further. All right, and there was one, one other. More. Absolutely, please. Let's have. In. Hi. You can. Yeah, I'm just Lydia move. Ramos. How are you? Hi, Lydia. Um, yeah. When it got to nine o'clock, I, I was like, "Well, it's okay." But so, thank you for staying um, and having being able to have the opportunity. I was going to ask a question about achievement gaps and learning loss, and if we had metrics for this year to kind of know where our children are prior to. Um, any type of state assessments, like if that was something that was going on. But after hearing from the rest of the community and, and you know, absorbing their perspective and things that are on their mind, I just, you know, I think it's really important that when we have 
these community forums, that there are like more voices. There's more, this community is what it is. And there are diverse perspectives. There are all types of cultures and languages. I think you all said 505 English language learners, mm -hmm. 39 languages in the district. Mm -hmm. I've heard about enrollment data that the, the largest you know, population of new enrollment are going to be students who were not born here. Mm -hmm. So there's, we need to have people who can come here and share and feel like it's a safe space. And I would, I was wondering what the board, what their feelings are on how that is fostered. I, I look around, um, sometimes you're the only person in the room, you know, the only of just your kind of onlys or, you know, your group or how you identify, how do we make it where there's some psychological safety because the conversations that need to happen around something that is very, it's important and it's necessary to understand um, that children, all students, have to be met where they, they are at. They all have their own individual needs and they all have lived experiences that may have them show up in the classroom in all different ways. So how do we make this site this, you know, how do we make these safe spaces conversations so that these types of forums can be beneficial and valuable and things happen? Just curious. <laughs> I, I would make a quick comment that mm -hmm. perhaps one of the first or maybe continuing step is the various committees that we've been talking about and um, the PTAs and the boards, and they're all made up of volunteers. And if individuals in the community, if they don't have time in their schedule to be involved, to go to neighbors and friends and say, you know, look, I, I went to a community forum and we talked about this and, and I hope that you would be willing to volunteer. So I think the communication piece again is talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends and encourage them because we are looking for individuals to participate and hopefully it's a welcoming environment. And if we all can work, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I, I would like to comment too that um, thank you for being here. You know, thank you for thank you for being with us tonight. And and it's very important to us as a board that we do look around and we see a variety and we see a diversity and we are inclusive. And that's why we passed that policy in the fall. And that's why we're moving forward with those things. And so I'm I'm really hopeful. I have a great passion about it. And I'm really hopeful that when we get those committees of it at individual school buildings first that are going to connect with a larger building, larger district committee, those are the kinds of things that are going to come out of that. So it's going to start small. It's going to be slow, as Dr. Brown Hall said. But, you know, we're just going to build that community bigger and bigger as we go. So thanks for being here today. I just wanted to share, too, that, you know, to answer your question, I, I have to think about, well, it starts with intention. For At least for me, it starts with intention. And so I, I know what my intentions are when I when I get up in the morning and when I come here in service as a board president. And we, we start, we're starting slow, right? We, we have a policy regarding DEI. We, had a, we established a board goal this year regarding DEI, but we don't want it to just be lip service. We want it to be something that we are really listening to each other. So that intention goes along with the listening piece. And I know that when Dr. Brown Hall came on board, he started with listening. He started by holding listening tours. We here tonight are, in the, are trying to do more listening than speaking, right? Because if my lips are flapping all the time, I'm not hearing anything. So I want to make sure that I'm doing my part to listen and be open. And so I, I thank you for sharing. And we just have to keep moving forward, right? We just got to put one foot in front of the other mm -hmm. and keep doing what we do. 
and and working as hard as we can to try and get as many voices as possible. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> oh, well, you know, your initial point was about academic <laughs> achievement. And, you know, last uh, board meeting, there was a very strong presentation about where the district was and, uh, and that type of information. So I'm sure it's available in board docs. I won't repeat it. But some of the concepts that we've mentioned about safety, acceptance, inclusion, mental health, all impact academic achievement. You can't learn if you're not comfortable in that environment, if you feel you are an outsider, or if you're uncomfortable in your situation. Uh, having, I've been in a district more than most of you, um, you know, I would say that one of the positive things that I've always observed uh, and my children having gone through the district <coughs> is it, uh, it's been a very welcoming uh, situation. Uh, and if it hasn't been, then, you know, really the teachers or the administrators uh, aren't really doing what they're supposed to be doing. So uh, I would hope, again, when you look at that big piece of academic achievement, which is what our board uh, is responsible for, as well as the budget, that all children would feel, whatever their background, wherever they've come from, that this is their home and they would feel comfortable here. And we would treat our students as we would our own children because that's what they are. And Lydia, you make a great point about having those uncomfortable conversations and being a safe space. But we have to realize also there's going to be many times we're going to have to have uncomfortable conversations in spaces that we don't deem to be safe because that's how we advance the conversation, right? But we have to realize when those times are because sometimes it's appropriate to do it and sometimes it's not. And so just being mindful of that too, as, as I had to be tonight. So thank you very much, Olivia. Thank you. All. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Um, Mr. Biscaglia, did we find... Uh, there any other? No. No? Was it Brenda? Did Brenda... Oh. No, her hands down. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I would say there last last call. Is there anyone in the audience who felt that they would like to speak and didn't have the opportunity? One, two, three. All done. I just want to say thank you to everyone who joined us tonight and participated in our conversation. Thank you, Dr. McCleary and Mr. Biscaglia for facilitating. Thank you. Our next board meeting is April 19th. Please be well and have a good night.